Hello, Crosspoint family. We're in the month of March, and that means Easter's here. So it's the perfect time to be at the place to be. That's our series, the place to be. In California, we have some beautiful places. We have the Malibu beaches, and we have Mammoth Mountain, a lot of places to see. But we're going to go on a journey with Jesus to go to and learn from the places he visited and brought victory to. We're going to start at the Jordan River. We're going to make our way to the Sea of Galilee. We're going to travel all around until we get to the empty tomb. So this is a time to receive. This is a time to behold. This is a time to be changed as we move with Jesus. Before we get to the message, check out the great things happening at Cross Point Church. Good morning, everyone. Was it, isn't it awesome to be in the presence of the Lord, in, in the house of the Lord, to worship? Uh, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. How many love to worship? Yeah, all right, good. I just want to make sure there's at least 20 of you that like to worship. Um, because I was thinking about, like, I'm up here earlier than usual, so I don't, as much as I want to worship, I don't know if that was kind of like a hint, like, Leaf, you're teaching way too long, so we're giving you more time. I'd rather have more time in worship, and then we'll do some teaching, too. Does that sound okay? All right, good, good. Hey, we're about to jump into our new series, The Place to Be. We're going to be going to and learning from the places that Jesus visited and brought victory to. We're on a five-week journey from the starting place of his ministry at the Jordan River where he was baptized to the ultimate place of his ministry, the victory of the empty tomb. And we're going to go to the Sea of Galilee. We're going to go to the temple. We're going to go to the Mount of Transfiguration. We're going to take the triumphal road down to the Jerusalem and celebrate. And then we're going to get to the, on Good Friday, the garden. And uh, we're going to get to Cal- uh, Calvary, Golgotha, the place of the skull. And then we're going to find ourselves at the empty tomb. And on March 31st, I want you to get ready. I want you to already be inviting people. The title of the message is The Easter Escape Room. The greatest victory in the hardest place. So it's going to be great. Uh, One announcement before we get to the Jordan River is we have a trip to Cambodia. We have a missions trip going to Cambodia in May. And in the lobby today, in the lobby, there's going to be the, the team going has provided nachos. Nothing says church service like nachos. So you can get nachos. It's a suggested donation of $3. If you'd like to give more, that's great. But let's support what God's doing because we are getting ready to go. And the last announcement, since they gave me so much time today, is when you came in, you may have seen the tables at the end of each of the um, the entrances on the ends. We have these little cards, and each week we're going to have them, the place to be. You'll get these as a PDF each week, and this week is the Jordan River. It has key events that took place in the Bible at the Jordan, interesting facts about the Jordan, and on the back, it'll have the main teaching points along with a place to take notes. So now that I've done all the announcements, let's get to the message. Have you packed your essentials? Have you cleared your schedule? Do you have your passports? Are you ready to partake in an adventure of going with me to the places that Jesus went to, the places that bring us to a place of seeing, believing, awe? We take away something because whenever we go on a journey with Jesus, we are being moved and we are being formed into who he wants us to be, that he wants to lead us into good places. In Psalm 43, 3, It says, send me your light and your faithful care. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain. And so we are going to go to the Jordan River today. We are going to learn from Jesus, this important place, this starting place. And one of the things we have to understand is Jesus didn't just empty himself fully for us by coming to the earth. He didn't just empty himself, but he embraced fully the mission of salvation. And that's very important that he didn't just empty himself and show up, but he embraced the mission of salvation for you and for me. And so we're going to be on a journey together, and we're going to learn together. And um, as we go, there are some places you don't want to miss. There are places that are too good to be true. There are places that you are disappointed it took you so long to find out about. I, was, I came to California at 10 years old when my parents got divorced. My mom won custody, so I was taken out of New York, New York, and brought to California. And I was here at 10, but I never had in and out until 10 years later. I still have family issues over that. We'll deal with that in a different series, Boundaries. And then on Joni and I, our first anniversary... We went to Santa Barbara. I had lived here 20 years and never been to Santa Barbara before. I was like, how could you keep this good stuff from me, people? I wanted to visit these places. Now, I don't know if you heard about this, that Utah has its first in and out this year. 
And they had their first in and out. And on the first day of the first day at Utah in and out, it was an eight-hour drive through line. That was the place to be in Utah. So we are going on a journey, and we're going to experience. And I want you to know, you and I, we can fully experience everything Jesus offers. We can fully experience his love, his grace, his spirit. And I don't want any of us to be robbed like I was 10 years waiting for in and out that manna from California, not manna from heaven. That I don't want you to miss out and go, I did not know that I could learn this in my life at this age. I didn't know I could still receive blessings. I, salvation was enough. Heaven is enough. Leaf, you didn't tell us. Pastor Michelle in small groups, you didn't tell us. Pastor Charlie and young adults, you didn't tell us. No, we're here to say, let's go on this journey together. Amen? So go to Mark with me. Mark 1. We're going to just start right there in the gospel. Mark 1, 1 through 13. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Verse 4. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. I don't know if that was bigger than feeding the 5,000, but it sure does sound like it, doesn't it? The whole countryside of Judea and all Jerusalem came out to see him. And they came out to see him, and then they, confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Verse 9. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming out of, out of the water, he saw heaven being, watch this, torn open. I'm going to come back to that. That's too good. The heaven was torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Verse 12. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. So as we get ready for this message, and we're coming to the starting place of this series, the place to be, we're going to be talking about two things that we love to talk about in church that everyone gets pumped up for, everyone gets excited about, confession and repentance. But as we get there, I want you to know, we sang a song, I want to be near where you are. I want to draw near to your heart. I have good news for us. We can sing that over and over. I, want to, I just want to be where you are. I want to draw near to your heart. I just got to let you know, as loud as we can say that, as honest as we can say that, as passionate as we can say that, God is saying that about us. I want to draw near to your heart. Remember Jesus' name, Emmanuel, God with us. So I want to give you a point, three points. Number one, that the Jordan River is a place of a witness to heart change. It's a witness to heart change. The ministry of Jesus begins with a messenger named John. It had been 400 years since the book of Malachi that there had been a prophetic word, that there had been a vision, that there had been a declaration of God's message to his people. 400 years, and John shows up on the scene. And as Mark says, this is the beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ. And Mark just gets right to the point. He's an evangelist, and he just wants you to know, this is the Son of God. This is the Savior of the world. This is the truth. In fact, Mark's gospel is the shortest gospel. 16 chapters, Matthew 28, Luke 24, John 21. But Mark's gospel has the phrase, good news, more than any other gospel. And he gets right to the point, and he says, he quotes Isaiah 40, verse 3. Um, how many have heard that quote before? I will send my messenger before you. He will prepare the way. But this is also found in Malachi 3.1. So we've had 400 years from the time, the last time God spoke through a prophet to the time of Jesus, which I find interesting because it was 400 years that Israel was enslaved in Egypt until they were exited out. They were brought out of Egypt. So if you look at verse 4, it says, And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. 
So he's at the Jordan. We have the black and white of the Jordan, but here's a color picture of the Jordan. The Jordan River spans about uh, just over 200 miles. And here's the Jordan River. And the Jordan River is this beautiful place and this place in Israel. And, and he comes bringing a message of forgiveness. How many have been to Israel, by the way? How many have been there? I've had people come up to me before service. I'm going to send you pictures. Do you need pictures? I'm like, yes. Next week's the Sea of Galilee. Send me pictures right now. But he comes preaching this message. And this word repent, it's very important in Greek, metanoia, metanoia. It means two things. One, it means to change your mind about something but then it means to turn around or to turn from something. It means to change your mind and to turn around. And so John comes preaching a message, and this is the starting place. Our hearts need to hear the message of good news. And then our hearts need to be moved and melted to receive the gift. Because every heart before Jesus is hard. Every heart has fences, has security systems, has boundaries, doesn't want certain people in. We create fences and boundaries, and we have tendencies, and we don't know how to let people close to our heart. We don't know how to let people into our heart because our hearts have been wounded, haven't they, before? Has you, how does it feel? Does it feel good when your heart gets wounded? No. I mean, I could stub my, my toe. I can get a broken finger, but to have your heart wounded is tough. And so we create these walls. We create these fences. I remember when we bought our house in Thousand Oaks, and we had uh, friends come over, and they were walking around the house looking it up and down. And it's a nice house. It's, a, it's an okay house. And they're looking, and they went in the backyard, and they're just kind of looking at our house like this. And the man says, you need to get some kind of plants or bushes that will block the view of your neighbor. Your neighbor could just see into your backyard. And he was really concerned and he kept on saying it like eight times. Like, I'd be like, how do you, what do you think of the house? What do you think of the living space? What do you think? We're going to put a pool right here. He goes, you really need to block your neighbor's view. Like, that's all he cared about. Like, I'm like, come on, this is a nice house. Block your neighbor's view immediately. I mean, like, do you know something about my neighbor? Like, what's going on? But we tend to block things. We tend to keep things hidden. We tend to guard things. We put a security system up around our heart. And unintentionally, we can even be guarded against the Lord who's always good and always faithful. Think about what God says in Ezekiel 36, 26. Here's his promise. I will put, give you a new heart and I will put my spirit in you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Like he promises to give us a new heart. And one of the things I love most about being a pastor and being a child of God and actually going through this journey myself of giving my heart to Jesus at 18 years old, not growing up in a Christian home, I love when people's hearts are changed by the love and the mercy and the power of God. And I'm talking about radically changed. Like that person, man, was angry at God for so many years because their parent left them as a child. That person is so arrogant. Whenever you bring up God, they always have an answer. They always have a scoff. They always roll their eyes. That person is so disinterested in God that when you say, hey, do you want to join us at our Easter? Don't even say it. But it's going to be a great message, the Easter escape room. And Pastor Leaf will have corny jokes. No, I'm not going. They, they're disinterested, and something changes. I love when people have a radical change in their heart. That's something, the walls come down, they're moved, and the heart is melted so that they can receive what God has. See, we have to change. Our, our heart changes, turning around, changing our mind about what we thought was true, what we thought was right, what we thought was good, what we thought got us into heaven. We change our positions about God. Our heart changes. Wait, God isn't just up there ready to strike me with lightning bolts every time I make a mistake. You know, God's not up there correcting my every move, like my uh, history teacher in ninth grade who slammed my paper on the, that C minus paper on my desk and red marks, you could see I still have issues from that. Like, that's not God. In fact, do you know that verse? How many know that verse? Um, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives it generously without finding fault. Have you ever heard that verse before? Do you know why he gives generously without finding fault? It's not because you haven't sinned or you never mess up. That's not the without finding fault. He gives you wisdom generously without finding fault because you do not have all wisdom. You do not know beginning from end. I know my experiences that have happened to me. I know what's happening right now. I could tell you what I'm going to preach the next two points. But I don't know what's going to happen an hour from now, a day from now, a week from now, a month from now. I need wisdom. He doesn't find fault in the fact that I am not all-knowing. And he says, I'm going to give you wisdom. 
But I love when God gets into our hearts and changes those rough places. Comes to the person who's hardened. Comes to the person who's selfish. Comes to the person who's broken. Comes to the person who's chained by the lies of the world, the lies of the enemy, who's living a life of sin. I don't know if you've ever met a person who's changed political parties. I know we're in an election year. I'm going to make this quick, but I want to give you the example. It's pretty radical for someone to go to, from Democrat to Republican or from re- Republican to Democrat. And, and I'm always fascinated, like, what got you there? How did you make that radical of a change? Like, that's a change in ideology, candidates, positions, um, things about uh, just moral compass, all this different stuff. I'm like, how'd you get there? But something has changed in them radically. And I just want to be a person that's radically changed by God. Not my ways, but his ways. Can you think of a person for a moment? Can you think of a person who's been radically changed by God? Can you, does a person come to mind? Maybe it's you. Maybe you're sitting here and you were radically changed by God. His love changed you. Can you think of that person who's been radically changed by God? That his heart has been radically changed. Her heart has been radically changed She's no longer seeking the love and affirmation of man after man, weekend after weekend, but she's seeking the affirmation of God. He's no longer seeking the affirmation from others based on how much he makes annually or how strong he is or his athletic accomplishments, but he's seeking the affirmation that comes from God. Now, would you do this with me? Would you do this for a moment? Because preaching is not just about listening. I always, when I pray for the message, I say, Lord, at the at the reading of the word, at the teaching of the word, at the hearing of the word, and at the doing of the word, may your name be glorified. So it's not just about hearing it. Can you think of one person this Easter that needs a heart change? Can you think of one person who needs a radical change? I don't know if it's a neighbor, a coworker, a family member. I don't know if it's someone you've invited to church for the last eight Easter's. They're coming this year. Would you close your eyes and for 20 seconds pray a blessing over that person? Just pray. Lord, we pray a blessing. Just say that. I bless, maybe it's Alice. I bless Tom. Just say, ask God to meet them and touch their heart. That wall would come down. That fence would come down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. One of the things about John's message This preaching at the Jordan, it's found in all the Gospels in one way or another. But one of my favorite places in the Gospels is Luke 3. And in Luke 3, he says, produce fruits, verse 8, in keeping with repentance. So he is calling them to a change. He says, you need to produce fruits that keep with repentance. Has anyone else noticed it's hard to keep fruit fresh? You have to, first of all, you have to wait for it to get ripe. Then you have to eat it and keep it fresh. And he says, you need to produce fruit fruit that keeps with repentance. And here's what's amazing. It says all the country of the Judean country and all Jerusalem came to see him. Again, that might have been more than the 5,000 that Jesus even fed. I don't know, but that sounds like a lot of people, all the Judean countryside and all Jerusalem. And it, it's, it's the country folk and it's the city slickers. It's the rich and it's the poor. It's the young and the old. And this is what happens in Luke 3. Everyone comes and says, hey, John, What does true change in the heart look like? Repentance, remember, to turn around and to change your mind. What does true change in the heart look like? And he says, if any of you has two jackets, share with the one who has none. And that blows the people away. So then, listen to this, the tax collectors come up. Hey, John, what does true change in the heart look like? We're not getting it. And he says to them, make sure you don't take more than what is required of those you take taxes from. The soldiers are blown away, and they come over here and say, hey, John, can you tell us what true change of the heart looks like? And he says that you would deal fairly and kindly with others. Do you notice that in the Luke 3 passage, every per people group is covered, every person is covered. And so here's the point. We each have conditions that need correction. We each have conditions that need correction. Have you ever said to someone gently or maybe not so gently, you should have that checked out? <laughs> like, you should have that checked. I remember I was playing basketball, and I injured my, my pinky finger, 
And I thought it was like, I played basketball a long time, so I thought it was just a jam and I was going to be okay. The next morning I woke up, it was like huge, and I couldn't even put my hand through my, um, my hair to, to shampoo it. But I thought, you know, I'm, you know, shampoo's overrated. I'm a 20-something-year-old guy who needs a shower. So I go to work, and I knew it was bad when some of the people in the office gasped. And they're like, you need to go right now and get that checked. I ended up breaking my finger, needing a cast. But have you ever said to someone, you should get that checked? See, we all have conditions that need correction. Whether you've walked with Jesus for days or for decades, whether you're just discovering who he is or you deeply know him, whether you have learned from past mistakes or it seems like you keep getting tripped up every Tuesday over that same issue, that we all need to repent. We all need to have a change of thinking and a turning from things. Sometimes it's not about just turning into sal- from death to salvation. I need to sometimes turn from my bad attitude. I know it's hard to believe that I have a bad attitude, but I do. I need to turn from that bad attitude. Sometimes I need to turn, or we need to turn, from the pride in us that tells us I don't need to listen to anyone or do what anyone else says. I am in charge up in here. Some of us, it's how we handle our possessions and our finances and our time that needs a change. For some of us, it's the wrong thinking about God, Jesus, and spiritual truths that just need a little adjustment and change. Sometimes it's the reckless way we live out our lives without considering the effect on others, the consequences, and does it even please God. You know, in Proverbs it says, A reckless person, a careless person is hasty with their steps, but the one who is cautious is wise. And sometimes we're just not in that place. We just move and make decisions. Uh, If I could just give you a freebie, it wasn't even in the 9 o'clock message, so maybe the 11 o'clock is just a special place right now, the place to be, the place to be. Look at that. That should be a series. But um, can I just encourage you that 90% of your decisions and your moments are not emergencies? Slow down. Make sure you're always taking that stuff to Jesus. You know, like it's not an emergency. I used to complain about how much work I have to do. I think I was talking to Pastor Charlie about this. I complained about how much work I have to do until I realized that I create 90% of my workload. (laughs) You know, like I I create 90. I'll just do as many messages as possible just to show how spiritual. I. No, just Lord speak. That's what we really need. So in Acts 3.19, it says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. 1 Peter 4.17, Judgment begins in the house of the Lord. That can sound scary to some, harsh to some. That may bring up bad feelings of a maybe an ultra-legalistic church or a controlling spiritual leader in your life. But don't let that rob you. Don't put up the fence on your heart. When it says judgment must begin in the house of the Lord, what that actually is is a blessing because that means it gives us the first opportunity to humble ourselves. It gives us the first opportunity to get it right. It gives us the first opportunity to say, wait, I'm wrong. You're right. Doesn't the Bible say, let God be true and every man a liar? So God, speak to me if you want. Work with me. Each of us has conditions that need correcting. In a moment, we're going to come to communion, the Lord's table, the Passover, the Last Supper. And when Jesus wanted to have this meal with his disciples, he said something. He said, assuredly, I say to you tonight, one of you is going to betray me. You know what happens? They all ask, is it I? Do you know why they all ask? Because they're all capable of it. They're all capable of it. You don't have to ask that if you're not capable but they're all capable. And so I have a condition that needs correcting, whether it's pride, whether it's selfishness, whether it's mismanagement of my life, whether it's allowing things in that should never get in. I have to be real about that condition being checked. So when I was an assistant pastor at the Church on the Way, I was in my early 30s. I had transitioned from being the youth pastor. So what happens when you're one of the younger pastors is they make you meet with all the people that no one else wants to meet with. So this lady I didn't know wanted to meet with me. I'm like, great, I'm, I, got, I have a master's degree. I hope this works. And, and she comes in and for 30 minutes is ranting, venting about the church, the things she doesn't like, venting about the people she doesn't like, ranting about California, what she doesn't like about California, talking about people groups. And I'm just like, wow, she just must feel comfortable telling me how she feels. It was like a paid commercial or infomercial, but I was paying for it, not her. So she's just going off on 
these people take advantage of the system. These people do things and cut corners. And she's just these people, these. So I'm just listening. And um, this was actually one of my good moments. I didn't always have good moments like this. But I said, um, you know, hey, do you think maybe like you're sharing all this? Like maybe God wants you to pray for those people. Have more compassion. That went over her head real quick. She kept on venting. I'm like, okay. And she is just going in. She is just like harsh. And so I'm listening, and I'm like, well, I think, you know, the Bible says do not judge lest you be judged. She couldn't hear that either. So what's the next tactic here? I mean, this is 30 minutes of pure torture. I'm never getting that time back. Um, And so then I'm like, hey, can I just ask you a question? Because you keep on talking about people taking corner, uh, cutting corners, taking advantage of people. Hey, have you ever driven over the speed limit? Like even one mile per hour? No, I've never done that. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. So this is a true, I mean, this is a true story. This happened in my office. So I said to her, hey, have you ever um, taken a paper clip or a pen home from work and used it for personal usage? Like, have you ever taken anything that wasn't yours? No, I've never done that either. There's just, there was no checking her condition. So if you don't check your condition, it can't be corrected. So point number one, again, is the Jordan is a, a, a witness to heart change. Number two, the Jordan is a washing away of sin's chains. Our chains fall off because of Jesus. And they're not falling off meant to be put back on. They're falling off and they're meant to stay buried. When our kids go from riding on on the training wheels to riding that bike super fast and super talented, we don't say to them, hey, go back to the training wheels. That that would be safe. They got it. We are not chained any longer. So look at verse 5. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. And they're baptized. Now, the Jordan River, again, we have a picture, another picture of people getting baptized. And this is just a portion of it, but people are getting baptized. Women and men are getting baptized. And these women and men are getting baptized. I don't know how many of you were baptized in the Jordan, but that must have been an awesome experience. But I want to rename the Jordan River just for a moment. Is that okay? I want to rename it to the River of Good Riddance. Good riddance to my old self. Good riddance to the sin that buries me and burdens me. Good riddance to the failures. Good riddance to the shame. Good riddance to the things that are keeping me from being who I'm meant to be. Because God wants us to keep growing. Can I get an amen? So what I find fascinating, I just have to tell you this. The whole town, the whole city is listening to this eccentric evangelist, this pure prophet, And he's preaching a message of challenge and change. He is preaching challenge and change. He is preaching a message of challenge and calling them to change at the Jordan. The Jordan is a transition point. It's a border. Because the Jordan is the place that Israel before it was wandering in the wilderness, and they had to cross over to possess the promise of Canaan, the promised land. The Jordan is a crossing over place, just like the Red Sea was a crossing over place from slavery in Egypt to moving towards the promised land. The Jordan is an important place, and this idea of crossover is so important. John 5, 24, these are Jesus' words. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. You've crossed over. It, you have to have a cross over to the goodness and the grace and the great glory of God. Amen? You have to cross over. And I just find it fascinating that this message is challenging and calling people for change. This wasn't their favorite preacher coming into town, into their area, and I'm going to skip going to Cross Point this Sunday because Jensen Franklin's here, or Stephen Furtick's here, or Beth Moore's here. This is amazing. This wasn't an Elevation Worship Conference. This wasn't a Live Your Best Life Expo. This wasn't a book, sell, a book signing of a bestseller. This was, hey, you, deal with your sin. Hey, you. It's time to confess. Bring your sin to the Lord. I think I heard a pastor friend of mine, he tells this story that 
he's after service in the lobby, and he's meeting all these people, and this couple comes up to him, this young couple, first time there, and he's talking to him and talking to him, and he ends by saying, I hope you enjoyed your time here. As he goes to his car, the pastor goes to his car, and he feels the Holy Spirit immediately check him. I didn't want them to enjoy their time. I wanted them to be challenged. They're living in sin. They're not taking me seriously. This was one of their opportunities to have a turnaround. I didn't want them to enjoy their time. I was like, ooh, that's tough. But there's something that needs to happen. And I think one of the things that's happened is we've lost the life-giving potential of repentance and confession. Like repentance and confession is not a bad thing. Doesn't James 5 say, confess your sins amongst one another and be healed? I am all for worship nights and encounters. I'm all for healing and signs and wonders. I'm all for speaking in tongues, interpretation, word of wisdom, word of knowledge. We had a tongue last week. Pastor Mike led us in ministry time and there was a tongue. I'm all for encountering God. I love Jesus. I don't have any rhythm, but I'll dance up there and I can't sing, but I'll sing right there. I love Jesus. But I think we've missed the life-giving potential that confession and repentance has in our lives and in our church. I don't know if we preach about it enough. I don't know if we prioritize it enough. I don't know if we personally practice it enough. And I just want you to say, I want to say to you as a friend and as a, your pastor, confession and repentance is not the death of us. It's life to us. I didn't get any amens. I'm a little worried. Let me say it again. Confession and repentance is not the death of us. It's life to us. Well, there you go. I'm driving home one day praying. One of the most important moments in my life. I'm driving home praying because for me, my, my car is my prayer closet. I don't know where you're, if you have a prayer walk, if you have a room. Uh, when you have four kids, there's no prayer closet in the house. So I'm praying, and I'm asking God, Lord, bless the youth group of the church. Lord, I pray for the message. Lord, bless the finances. I'm, I'm praying all these things. I am praying. I'm going after. I love Jesus. I hear the Holy Spirit speak to my heart. Leaf, when was the last time you said sorry to me? I love God. Now, here's how I knew it was the Holy Spirit. It was firm, but it was gentle. It was clear, but it was kind. As I'm praying, I hear the Holy Spirit speak to my heart as clearly as I've ever heard the Holy Spirit. As I'm praying, I'm just giving a list of things, calling on the name of the Lord. He says, Leaf, when was the last time you said sorry? Sorry for how you spoke to your wife and kids. Sorry for looking at a person that way. Sorry for, you know, a lack of faith, whatever it is. You know, because even in James it says anything that's not faith is sin. So I'm sure there have been times I didn't have the faith to believe and I didn't apologize. At least Peter, when he put the net on the other side of the boat and he caught all the fish, he did what God said obediently, but he still got out of the boat and said, Lord, forgive me. I'm a sinful man. Like he knew he didn't believe. And so I heard this and I'm like, man, I've got to keep getting to a place where I'm growing. You know, this word for confessing, homologia, homologio, it's a compound of two words. One word is the word we get logos, logos, the word. And, and this word logeo means to speak out. And then homo, like a homo sapien, homo is the same as. So it means to say the same thing as. So when you get, if you ever get pulled over by a police officer and, you, and they go, you're going, a, were you going a little fast, my friend? Yeah, I was. You're saying the same thing as the officer, right? You're saying the same thing. You're confessing. Let God be true and every man a liar. And this idea of repent, believe, confess, and be changed is a part of the gospel message. It's a part of the freedom. What would it be like if we let the Lord examine our hearts more? Be real with God. Be real with each other. I want to be real. I, I hope we're a real church where we let the Lord examine us and test us and that we come out shining forth, you know, like that, that gold put in the fire. Could you imagine this? I'll give you a picture of this. If you go get your taxes done and your preparer says, hey, um, I'm seeing three or four things that don't line up that might be a problem, but let's just turn them in anyway. Would you be okay with that? What if your doctor came back and said, hey, we've run all the tests, we've run all the blood work, I've crossed out everything except three things don't look right, but you know, I think you're good. I'm just going to, you know, we will we'll deal with that at a different time. Are you okay with that? Let me give you another one. You go to the, your auto mechanic, and why does it every time you go to an auto mechanic, there's something else happens? They give you the bill, and what if my auto mechanic who goes to our church in Thousand Oaks, what if he said to me, hey, Leaf, um, listen, 
I think it's all good. Um, but if you go over 50 miles per hour, there's just a weird sound. But you're good. You, you can go. Like, would we be okay with that? Would we be okay if our tax preparer said, no, you're good. Like, if you get audited, what, what's the big deal? Would we be okay with our mechanic saying, hey, your car, when it reaches 50 plus, it's making some sound. I know I wouldn't be okay with that. How much more my very soul that the Lord might want to examine and not to break me down, not to make me pay more, to set me free. I believe there's freedom in the house of the Lord. Amen? So in 2016, I decided to get baptized again. I was 45 years old. I was the pastor of the church. You may be thinking, Leaf, that's the wrong order. You should have been baptized and then be a pastor. But what happened is I got saved at 18. My mom and my sister and my stepdad got saved a year before me. And I didn't know anything about Jesus. Like, I didn't know Jesus and Easter were the same thing. I Now, I came to faith, and I started to learn and grow. But my mom was just on my case every day. Leaf, you have to get baptized. Leaf, you have to get baptized. You have to get baptized. Leaf, you have to get baptized. I mean, it was like Delilah with Samson. I mean, it was, just, it was just constantly in my ear. So I said, Mom, I'll get baptized on one condition, because I was very insecure. I said, I don't want anyone there. I'll get baptized if no one's there. And my mom said, okay, good. We'll do it at the church we go to. This was before Church on the Way. So we show up. The pastor's talking to me. I'm like, yeah, I want to get baptized. Yeah, I want to get baptized. They put me in the baptismal. All of a sudden, the curtain opens, and there's 100 people. It was their midweek service. And rather than going into the water and leaving the dead person behind and the chains behind and coming out and clothed in joy and victory, I was P.O.'d. All I could think about was I was tricked. All I could think about was this is not fair. And I wasn't thinking about the death and resurrection of Jesus. I wasn't thinking of newness of life like it says in Galatians. I was thinking, you turkeys. But in 2016 in our church, three people died unexpectedly two divorces, and we were moving into our new property. I was feeling a lot of pressure. I was struggling with insomnia, anxiety, and we were having a Sunday baptism. And the week of, I told our assistant pastor, I said, I need to be baptized. I need to be baptized. And I need to be baptized because of freedom that Jesus offers. Today, the word for us, church, today the chains can fall off and must stay buried. The chains fall off, the chains of fear, the chains of poverty, the chains of sickness, the chains of, of, of guilt and shame, the chains of oppression must fall off and stay buried. Nahum 1.13, now I will break their yoke from your neck and tear your shackles away. That's God speaking. I will break all the chains. So today, and I want to say to you, if you've yet to believe and be baptized, get baptized. If you were like me and got baptized for the wrong reason, get baptized. If someone, a parent, a grandparent, a guardian, baptized you for the right reason, but now you're an adult, get baptized. In two weeks, March 17th, we are going to have baptisms. My prayer is that you would get baptized. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. And that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. So number one, the Jordan's a place where there's a witness to heart change. Number two, the Jordan's a place where there's a washing away of sin's chains. Finally, the Jordan is a place walking in Christ's ways. Look at verses 10 and 11. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. What a formula. Jesus was submitted to baptism. The Spirit was received at baptism, and the Father was pleased with baptism. That's a pretty good formula right there. Jesus was submitted to it. He knew no sin, but yet he took on the baptism that everyone else took on. The Spirit received, and the Father was pleased at baptism. You know, in some places, in some cultures, the baptismal doesn't look like what we have here. It looks like what you're going to see on the screen. That in some places, the baptismal is in the shape of a cross, because the person, the woman, the man, the young, the old, they are entering into the place of death, aligning with the death of Jesus, and aligning with the resurrection of Jesus. They're, they're going in to die to the old person, and they're coming out in the victory and joy of a new creation. They're, they're, they're crucifying their flesh. My favorite verse, my life verse, Galatians 2.20 
For I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the one who loved me and gave himself for me. And so there's a going in. And I want to say that we follow Jesus in his footsteps because Jesus did not start his ministry until he was baptized. He didn't raise Lazarus from the dead. He didn't open the eyes of the blind. He didn't feed the 5,000 until he's baptized. He's baptized, and it was necessary because he's about to go into the wilderness and be tempted for 40 days, or he's going to fast for 40 days, and the devil's going to tempt him. He is going to go to town to town, and you've read the Gospels before. Sometimes he wakes up early in the morning teaching, and he stays all the way to sunset healing. He's going to go where there are so many needs, there are too many to count. He's going to have the naysayers, the haters, the skeptics in his face all the time. He's going to experience something he was never meant to experience, the eternal one, the one who was there in Genesis 1, equal with God. He's going to face death for us. And he does it, and he needed baptism. That was the launching into the authority of the Father and the Holy Spirit. Some of us, We're about to go into new frontiers in our life. 2024 has whole new frontiers, and they could be exciting. You need the Lord. Some of us have difficult decisions ahead. You need the Lord. Some of us have huge obstacles. You need the Lord. Some of us need miracle prayers, miracle answers to our prayer. We need the Lord. We're walking in uncharted waters. We're walking in a new path, and we need the Lord. And what I want you to see here, did you see that it says when Jesus came came up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. Have you ever heard that phrase, what goes up must come? I love the fact that heaven was torn open. I love the fact that heaven was torn open. Because when I think of something being torn open in the Bible, I think of the veil in the temple being torn open. See, when Jesus died, it was around noon, but the whole place was dark. There was no light. It says there was an earthquake. It says that the dead spirits came out of the graves. I know it sounds like Indiana Jones, but this is what the Bible says. And it says the temple, the veil of the temple was torn too. The veil, like the Jordan, was a boundary, was a transition. Holy place, but if you got inside the veil, the most holy place. And it's torn, and it was a symbol of entry and forgiveness. And I love the fact that the veil was torn because there's entry. But do you know what was torn before the veil was torn? The heavens were torn open. There was favor. For God so loved the world, favor, that he sent his only begotten son, love and favor, that whoever would believe in him would not perish. That's the forgiveness. But have eternal life. He tore open the heavens, and favor came for So many people think, God is just waiting to knock me down. God is so displeased with who I am. God is judging every step, every moment. And yes, he does judge our thoughts and intentions. But through Jesus, we have a mediator. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but have been justified freely by his grace. So today, 1 John 2, 6, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. As we move towards Easter, the wonder of resurrection, life, hope, and victory, would you get ready to walk with Jesus, following in his steps, to going and growing, to denying self and depending on him? You're going into battles. I wish I could tell you, no, it's all sweet. It's Julie Andrews, the sound of music. It's singing. It's beautiful. It's, um, it's Poppy from Trolls. It's, everything's just beautiful. No, you might be going into battles, but there's blessing. So I'm going to end with this and then pray for us. So there used to be a thing, everyone, for those under the age of 30. They were called photo albums. You'd put pictures actually in them. You like you put pictures in them. And a lot of times they were, you know, the the album was blue velvet or it was floral pattern. And you'd put the pictures in. You just didn't have them on your phone. You'd actually have pictures. And one of the things I, about photo albums, to me, they all look the same. But I love the photo album that had the picture on the cover. Because I knew, oh, that's our trip to here. That's our child's graduation. That was the family reunion. That was our first time at Disneyland. You know what I'm saying? Like, If you have like 20 photo albums and they all are blue velvet and floral patterns, how do you know which one is which? But when you have the one that has the picture on the front, 
It's like, oh, it's telling a story. It's telling me what this is about. Mark says, in the beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, the, son, the Messiah, the Son of God, it started at the Jordan, and it kept getting better and better. Would you close your eyes for a moment? Pastor Jeremy's going to come up in a moment, but I want to lead us. The Bible says, call to the Lord, and he will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you did not know. If you don't know where that is, that's Jeremiah 33.3. 3. It's easy to remember. 33.3. 3. Call to me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you did not know. As we get ready to come to communion, there is nothing magical, miraculous, powerful about the bread and the juice that we ordered from a supplier. But what's powerful is the invitation that Jesus gave to partake of his promise and what it represented. If there's someone in the room and you need healing, would you just lift your hand? Just lift your hand high. You're about to partake, and I believe healing is going to come. It may come now, but it, it might come while you're partaking. If you need healing, lift your hand. If you need financial provision, lift your hand. Financial provision, lift your hand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you need peace to know that God loves you and accepts you, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Thank you, Jesus. Getting it right about who God is. If you would like to receive the same forgiveness that all the Judean countryside, all of Jerusalem came for, and they were baptized and set free from their sin and received the gift of new life, resurrection life, and you've never received Jesus, never received Jesus, lift your hand just right now. You're going to receive open fully. I see one hand. I see two hand, three hands. Thank you, Lord. Four hands, five hands, six hands, seven hands. Just keep those hands up for a moment. Just keep those hands for a moment. As you partake, this, for those who are holding their hands up now, there are seven hands holding ha hands up. When you partake, I want you just quietly to yourself say, I receive, I believe. I receive, I believe. And then we'll tell you the next steps. We're celebrating those seven today. Lord, as we come to the table, we thank you that it is your table, Jesus, that you've set the table. And Lord, these elements are to, for us to remember just how much you love us and how you gave your life as a ransom for many. And so if you need the elements, please raise your hand and the ushers will come and make sure everyone has the elements. I was reading this morning in Deuteronomy where it talks about God's choice of Israel and God's choice of Israel just was based on his love. And so God's choice for us each and every day is he looks at us with love. And the scripture tells us that love covers a multitude of sin. So not one of us is capable of not making mistakes. And Jesus, Jesus came and he gave his life to cover all the things we do that break and destroy our own lives and the lives of those around us. He gave his life. He didn't hold anything back. He went to the cross. And the, the, the most, there's so many amazing things about the love of God, but I don't think I ever can, can fully comprehend that if it was only me, Jesus would have done it just for me. So if it was only you, and he would have given his life just for you. And so today as we partake of the bread, I want us to partake, where is it that you need God's touch, his miracle touch, his miracle healing, his miracle provision. So together, let us partake in faith that the God who loves us is the God that is going to meet the very present need that we have today. 
And so, Father, we thank you that you have given all things that pertain to life and godliness in Jesus. And Jesus, thank you that you gave your life for us. And we remember that we are loved. We remember we are loved. Amen. you with me as we're approaching Easter, that as we're remembering Jesus' sacrifice, he is bringing the cup before his disciples before he prayed in the garden. Because if we fast forward, he said, if there's another way for this cup to pass, if there's another way, if I can, if I can, if I can bring salvation to the people that you love, is there another way? And, and but he, but he took that cup for us. He took on the weight of our sin. He took on the weight of this world and its imperfections. He gave us the ability to be forgiven that all of our sin, all of our brokenness, all of our imperfections is co are covered with his blood. So Father, we thank you that the blood of Jesus was given. Jesus, thank you that you said yes to the cup of the cross and all of its pain, that for the joy that was set before you, the joy that we would be set free and reconciled to the Father, that you, you endured. And so, Lord, I thank you today that as we partake, we believe that you are covering those things in our life that need to be covered. We thank you for miraculous financial provision. We thank you for miraculous healing. We thank you for your move of reconciliation and relationships. Lord God, we thank you, Lord God, for peace in our world that looks like there isn't peace. We believe, Lord God, that Jesus, you are the one who came to save us, to forgive us, and to set us free. And we say amen as we partake. Amen.
bless your name, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And just how amazing is the power of his blood and the sacrifice made for us. And just again, we just thank you, Lord, and we praise you for today. Just some exciting news as we get ready to close this out. Um, we are talking about life-saving blood. And this past week, we were able to partner with the... Um, the blood bank and give donations and it was just a praise report that we wanted to share that uh, during this time every slot that we had hoped to fill was filled we were able to collect and donate over 35 units of blood to the blood bank which in this time is a great need so just thank you all for for your time and for donating um, four first-time donors 33 uh, presenting donors and just an amazing way for us to give back to our community so just as you go from this place know that our church cross point is making a difference in our community and we are so thankful for the power in our savior's blood and for the power that we use in in, in, in partnering with this uh, blood bank and so also as we get ready to leave today our prayer team will be here if you decided to give your heart to the Lord today, please come up, receive some prayer. We just want to agree in prayer for the things that God wants to do for your life. And we also have a Bible for you to take with you. So please join us, come up and have some prayer and just let us be a blessing to cover and come alongside of you. Thank you all for coming today. Have a great week. Be blessed on your way out. Thank you for being with us today. You know, one of the most important places to be is in church and in community together, and we're glad you made it today. Uh, we want you to check out and click the link below to find out what's happening at Crosspoint, our Easter week celebrations. You can worship with your giving or take next steps in your walk with Jesus and being a part of the Crosspoint community. Again, thank you for being at Crosspoint, and we hope to see you again next Sunday.